I've been asked to talk about the market for translation, and I'm happy to do so. I won't talk very much about the market in China because I'm working outside of China. And I'm going to address uh, the impact of technology. Uh, people say, oh, why are we still training translators when we have free online machine translation? And that's a very good question. And that's the question I'm going to address. It's about automation and the sociology of automation. Now, uh, there are many free online machine translation systems out there. Google Translate is one of them, not in China, but where I am. And uh, they announced in 2018 that they are processing 143 billion words every day. But I'm sure Yu Dao and Baidu and the rest are, are doing more than that, okay? But let's just go with 143 billion words. I think, because I've done a calculation, that there's about 333,000 professional translators and interpreters in the world, which means, if you follow the calculation, that Google Translate is rendering so much that professional translators, people who get paid to be full-time translators, are accounting for 0.69%. That is, a whole lot of translating is happening out there automatically. Very little is happening with or through professional translators. And that's why people say, well, why are we still training translators? Is there still a translation industry? And the answer is yes. Has translation been automated? Yes, undoubtedly. Are translators still needed? Yes, surprisingly. Here's a model that was presented by uh, Li Defang, actually in a talk in Barcelona, and it's taken from somebody called Wei, whom I don't know. Okay, so I'm getting it third hand here. Uh, this is the situation at the moment where we have a top premium sector working for very privileged moneyed clients, lots of professional translators and some machine translation happening. And the model here is that machine translation will aid what translators do in the middle there. It'll grow a bit, okay? Trouble is, I mean, that, that's a valid model. And, and uh, I've been criticized for saying a few years ago that all these professional translators will be working with machine translation. That is correcting it, doing what we're calling post-editing. It's not the only option though. Uh, at the top, you can do other things as well, as we're going to see in a minute. My take on this model, though, is like this. It's more like there's the model we just saw up the top there, and then there's all this happening with machine translation. Sociologically, that is a very interesting phenomenon. And as uh, scholars, we should be looking more at that, at what's happening with non-professional translation how people are using machine translation, for example, in language learning. I think there's a lot to be discovered there. But my topic today is this little bit up the top there. What's happening with those people there, those translators that are now being pushed up to the pinnacle of the, of the profession? It's not a bad model. Think of it's my favorite anal anal analogy is with singing. Everybody can sing. Even I can sing. We can sing when we're having a shower. We can sing when we're happy. But then there are professional singers who get paid. That's okay. And then there are opera singers who get paid a lot more. That's okay too. There are different levels of, of skill sets in the profession that can still be rewarded, even though it's done very widely. So I'm not uh, looking at, at this as a bad thing or a doomsday thing at all. Machine translation has a role in all of these places and many, many more, uh, which is fine. Okay, let me move on though. Besson many years ago wrote a paper on automation. The thing that machine translation is an instance of automation. Automation has been 
affecting professions since the beginning of technology, but, but very much really since the 1960s, computer automation in that sense, computerized workflows, etc. Now, Besson uh, did a comparison. He went through the United States uh, repertoire of jobs in 1950, and then the repertoire of jobs in 2010. And he looked at all the jobs that were there in 50 and 2010, and he found that only one occupation had disappeared. Can you guess which one had disappeared? Translators? No. Language teachers? No. Business English specialists? No. All of those have gone up. The one profession that has disappeared, according to this, uh, is a elevator operator or a lift operator, if you're speaking British English. Although Googling around, sorry, doing a web search, I found that there are still some elevator operators in really classy apartment buildings in Beijing and in Tokyo and in various other places around. So some still exist, but as an occupation that's existed. And it's crazy. Do, do people really need a specialist to press the buttons when you get in a lift? But yeah, that's the way people thought about it early on, okay? What happens is, says Besson, is automation increases productivity, right? We can translate more, we know that. That can stimulate the demand for products, which can increase work, the number of jobs and the number of people working, okay? So it's not this mentality, automation takes away human jobs. Automation can create jobs, but it certainly changes the nature of the jobs. One example given by Besson is, is now woefully out of date. Um, wow. We had automatic teller machines in banks. I know you people never use money anymore. But anyway, when we used to have money, uh, those automatic teller machines lowered the cost of having bank offices and so the banks initially put more branches and created more jobs for people in bank branches, okay? And they were doing different things like selling loans instead of just giving you your money or taking your, your money uh, as a bank teller did, okay? Now, what does happen though, and this is uh, from uh, Otto, another study uh, of, um, of automation. What happens though is when it comes in in general, there's a, a propensity to wage dispersion. If it's difficult to acquire the new skills with automation, those who can acquire them will see their salaries rise proportionally and those that cannot will not. So we find that automation in general has an effect on making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Or those who can learn the skills go up, those that can't learn the skills stay where they are or go down in relative terms. Now, that's the theory of automation. What's happening in translation? Well, there are some numbers out there and it's easy to find them. US Labor Department, 2020, that's okay. You're not working in the United States, but it's just an example. Tells us, to keep, they keep track of how many translators and interpreters there are it's growing. Job outlook, 2019 to 29, 20% growth, much faster than average. Okay, that's a 20% over the 10-year period. Huh? Uh, but still, much faster than average. The outlook is good, according to this source. So what happened to automation? In Canada, I don't know if you can see that, Translator, outlook over the next three years, three stars, good. <clears throat> and there's other numbers that back that up if you go and look into it. Uh, NIMSI is an organization of big uh, language service providing companies. And they have projected a compound annual growth rate of 7.4%, which is good growth. And they do a little graph to show what that looks like. Uh, going through to 2022, okay, the size of the uh, language service providers market. And this is how it's divided up at that end of the market. 
39% in the United States, and we can see China there. China is somewhere down there, okay? 5.2%. Uh, and, and Russia has quite a big, no, no, the United Kingdom. So it, it's an industry dominated at the top end with big language service providers, according to this data source by uh, United States, United Kingdom, Germany, and China in fourth place there, okay? There are other data sources. I'm just showing you what's out there. There is no sign here that automation is taking away uh, the demand for translations. Uh, Slater, which is a web source, uh, did a language industry market report predicting 21% from 19 to 22 which is consistent with uh, the previous number, 7%. As for China, we have these reports which come out every year, and we can compare them year on year. Wang Yuyi, a, a, a talk I attended actually in Beijing last year, uh, gave a talk giving numbers and showing that roughly the market is growing in China at about 10% a year, which was prior to pandemics, obviously. Uh, the 2019 report lists 3, 390,000 companies with language services. Okay, sorry, that was 18, that was 19. So we can calculate, sorry, that should be 18 there, a 13% annual increase, which concords with what was reported. I note though, that in the same source, we compare language service providers. These are companies that provide translation and language services. Actually, if you count up the number, it shows only a 1% annual increase, which is interesting. 13% for these companies that have language services, only 1% uh, for the others. And who knows what's behind the numbers? That's for the experts in China. It's very clear, though, that the market is very centralized in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong, okay? Uh, accounting for more than half of the language service providers. Now, I want to pick up that, that little warning there and associate it with this, which is another set of numbers, uh, that comes out from the European Competition Index 2019. Probably you can't see that very well. We're looking at language service providers here, companies that have translation among their services. Okay, it's not like a big company that has a translation department. Here, it's a company that provides language services. The big companies with more than 250 employees over seven years grow 86%. That, that's really good, okay? So automation, if it's having an effect, is working really well for the big companies. Let's go down though to 20 to 49 employees, minus 15%. 10 to 19 employees, minus 29%. Two to nine employees, minus 10%. This is worrying. It shows that if there is greater productivity, the rewards seem to be going to the larger companies and that smaller companies, you know, the lone translator or a few translators getting together, those smaller companies are not doing so well. They are not getting the benefits of technology. So this, these numbers uh, seem to concord with what's happening over in the other data from China that uh, companies that are not big and uh, not moving into uh, the use of technologies probably will not see their market share increase. Lesson, get into technologies to increase your productivity. Other sources, Jost Jetschke uh, carried out a survey and um, asked people what's happening with, uh, with automation and uh, many of them said, look, the, the real change is not machine translation, it's automated workflows in the bigger companies. So the people whose jobs are threatened are not really translators, 
uh, but the project managers, the people who organize translation work. Uh, so watch out. Automation doesn't concern just what's done with language. It concerns what's done in providing a complex service that requires coordination of many moving pieces on time. The same source provides areas in which uh, language service providers uh, work, and we can see that it's dominated here by information technology at the top, and the rest you can read as it goes down. So uh, automation, information, IT in general is having a very important impact. Takeaways from that survey, the language industry is dominated, increasingly dominated by large companies and large cities. That's where the rewards of automation may be going. Uh, IT creates huge demands for translation. It doesn't take it away, and you can see that there. And if you're a small company or a lone operator, you want to find out about technology. That's my takeaway on the back of that. I want to suggest that uh, there are good reasons why translation uh, should pay special attention to technology. Technology brings complexity and risk. Complexity because we don't understand. We don't understand what goes on inside machine translation. Linguists don't understand it anymore. It's all mathematics, probabilistic mathematics. Okay, and risk, because if we don't know the foreign language, we are never sure of the veracity or the value of that translation. When there is increasing complexity and risk in any service profession, the people providing the service cannot be judged on their actual skills. You can't see how well I translate from Catalan because you don't know Catalan, probably. Uh, Rovira y Virgili, University in Catalonia in Spain. Okay, Tarragona. Uh, so you have to trust me. Uh, and if it's coming through from a machine, you're probably going to trust the machine less than, than you're going to trust me because I've just convinced you I actually live in the country that speaks that language and my translations are going to be okay. Complexity and risk means that what we are selling as intermediaries is not really our skills because people can't check that. It's our status, our trustworthiness. And people are going to pay me not because I work really hard or really well because they can't tell. They're going to pay me because I look like I might work really hard and really well. Trustworthiness. And that becomes the main relative advantage of the human translator. The, ab the ability to communicate and establish trustworthiness. So we see in the training models in recent years, a movement towards interpersonal relations and the use of language to establish relationships with people, not just relationships with a text to be translated. And that becomes the main relative advantage. What does technology do? Ha! Well, in order to become trusted translators, we get signals of our status. Uh, these signals of many kinds, but here's one. It's, it's a person who is certified by the American Translators Association. This person has passed an exam, a very rigorous exam with less than 20% pass rate, this certification signals trustworthiness on the American market and beyond because the exam is rigorous. So people with it can get paid more. Okay, it's worth something. What happens? Uh, this person unfortunately put this certificate on their website somewhere. Somebody stole it. In fact, they stole their identity and they're set up somewhere in the Middle East uh, producing machine translations and pretending to be this human translator and getting money out of it. Okay, go and look up the translator scammers directory and you will find thousands and thousands of cases of this happening. So we know that the signals of trustworthiness have a market value because they are being stolen. 
and used to sell machine translations as if they were human translations. Uh, this is one of the ruses of technology. The important thing though is that the signals of trustworthiness have a market value. Let me see, what are they? This is for people who are thinking of becoming translators perhaps. Yeah, get an education qualification, that helps. Professional qualifications, professional exams, that helps too. CATI exams in China or the ATA in the United States. Membership of, prof of professional associations increases your status in the community and with regard to your client. Experience, your list of previous clients is of great use, but if you're just entering, you haven't got experience, so what do you do? Uh, if you're in a training program, it's very good to have work placements or internships to get some clients in the list for experience. Educationalists tell us that we should be enabling our graduates to build up portfolios so you can show a client exactly the work that you've done before. That's from the theory. What really counts though, still in this day and age, despite the technologies and everything else, word of mouth recommendation. Uh, so many people, I used to work for publishers uh, in Catalonia and uh, they would ask me, ah, Anthony, have you got any really good students? And I say, well, yeah, you can look at their grades. You can see who's good and who's not. No, 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 you tell me who's good. I, I need somebody to, to translate this novel. You tell me who's good. Why? Okay, it's just the way it works, word of mouth. Uh, if they turn out to be bad, then it's my fault and they can blame me. But that's uh, yeah. uh, the way the person presents themselves professionally. That is giving a good interview, presenting a CV that's good, having a website, etc., and your language skills. Uh, we did a survey of where our graduates go from our Master of Translation program in Melbourne and the skills that people are looking for and the top skills that employers were looking for among our graduates. Okay, this is just an experiment, um, a survey of some, what, fewer than, than 100 graduates. Uh, language skills, good English was number one. That's what the employers were looking for most of all. Why? Well, they can sort of check that, but they can't check the actual transfer of language skills. Uh, IT skills are also there as well, obviously. To say that you can use translation technologies, I don't mean uh, just using UDAL translator, um, but using uh, translation memory suites, uh, uh, sophisticated workflow models and content management, uh, that all helps. Increasingly, those things at the end there are going to work. Portfolios don't work because clients can't see the other language. It's those things there in red that are having the most weight on the market and helping people to get work. If you don't have experience, your main atout, your main thing that's in your favor is your youth because you will have better language skills and better IT skills. You'll be better at technology and you should make sure that that comes, becomes part of the way you signal your trustworthiness. Now, if we look around, we see that machine translation, to be specific about this piece of automation, is creating jobs, new jobs, in new areas. Firstly, post-editing, that is working with machine translation and correcting it and then authorizing it. Uh, this is where the translator's job becomes like a notary who says, ah, this is a valid document. I say it's valid. Okay, it, it, you, you, can, you can trust it. I put that stamp on it. And that uh, should be the sense of post-editing. Okay, uh, post-editing is being underpaid, grossly underpaid in, in many countries. I think there should be an upward re-evaluation of post-editing. 
Pre-editing, that is the treatment of text before they go through machine translation, is a logical thing to do whenever you're going into many languages. And there should be more work on pre-editing. Uh, the United States, interestingly, trains more technical writers than it does translators. In Europe, we tend to train, train more translators and fewer technical writers. Why? Well, the technology is moving from the United States in English, in technical English, to the languages of Europe. I leave China out of that. I don't know. But I think that we can see that many of the market demands for big projects, multilingual projects, are in pre-editing, correct, technical, simple English in this case, that then goes through machine translation very well. Revision and reviewing become huge areas where uh, human activity, high level, careful, trained human activity is required, basically because the effects of automation are you increase productivity, but uh, we decrease quality and it becomes harder to know where the errors are in the text. Project management has been, it's there in the list, although uh, the word is that project managers are being automated as well, uh, as I hear from uh, Jos Jeczke in California. Terminology becomes then part uh, really of the pre-editing and technical writing. Database management, the technical things that happen with the, uh, with the technologies. Uh, MT can create work in all these areas, and those are areas that we should be training people for, and many of us are training people for. In addition to that, though, that's working with the technology. A whole part of the training can move towards rewriting. That is, recognizing that in many fields, it's no longer enough just to translate a text or adapt that text for a particular market, a particular user. Sometimes we just have to rewrite our new text. And so the people we have trained as translators increasingly are moving into areas of public relations, marketing, cross-cultural consulting. I would add journalism there, although journalism outside of China is a disappearing industry. Uh, if you can communicate well across languages as a translator, you can communicate well across languages as anything. And so there's a wide open market uh, there at that end. Neural machine translation, which is the qualitatively improved translation since 2016, is pushing us towards new kinds of translations. And I'm just picking up words that appear in the literature. So I've mentioned journalism, translation and journalism. Journalation has been seen. Trans-editing is translation and editing, okay? Transcreation has been with us for a long time. Translation as an act or part of an act of artistic creation. Transadaptation has also been around for a long time. This is when you, not, you don't just translate the foreign cultural product, you adapt it to a new audience and new circumstances. I haven't found neologisms for these, translation and promotional work, but I know it happens because my graduates go there. Translation and public relations, okay? Now, uh, this means that because there is automation, uh, our employment moves to the areas where the automation has less effects. There are new kinds of hybrid jobs opening up. And these will not appear in the standard official statistics of uh, numbers of translators and interpreters because there are new translingual activities opening up. Uh, and their accessibility management, which is a term for audiovisual products uh, being adapted and uh, made suitable with um, closed captions for the hard of hearing and the deaf, for example, all that comes under the category of accessibility management. This is an article that came out in 2018. Esther Bond went through LinkedIn and collected all the names that are used for job titles that translators do. 
That is, people who have training as translators can do many wonderful different things. And she identified over 600 unique titles. That is, a translator these days is not just a translator. You can be working with technologies, working around technologies, combining with other things. I'll just close here. I've gone a bit too fast, I think. Uh, job descriptions among the list of 600. I just got a few that use the word solution. Is this the solution to the problem of how to survive in what might appear to be a dying profession? Here are some of the job descriptions with the word solution. A solutions architect. Ah, I, had, I, I, I used to make fun of a, a guy called Bert Esselink, who has written on localization. And his job in Lionbridge, which is one of the very big companies, was as a solutions architect. So he would solve the communication problems of the clients who came in, the big clients. And I'd make fun of him, but that this is nothing. There it is, though. It's a job title. He's trained as a translator. He works providing communication solutions, designing them uh, as an architect would. Director of Client Solutions, same idea. Solutions Consulting and Director of Technology Solutions. Cloud Solutions Architect. Oh, put them all in together. Okay. Easy to make fun, but these people are earning a lot more money than me. Solutions manager for machine intelligence. So as, I'll just take it back there. As technology automation brings complexity and risk, people look for trustworthiness. And these people, although they're trained as translators, have the necessary communication skills to provide what those clients and communicators can see as real solutions. They provide trust. And that's the aim of training translators for the current market, I suggest.